poppin' nerds, the Outraged Gamer is back in the saddle. All right, boys and girls, strap yourselves in, because it's time for a nice little rant about video game journalism. Now I tell you what, people. When I woke up this morning to the miserable and empty void that is my existence and thought about the best ways to work myself into a quivering rage to fill the gaping consumerist void that passes for a personality, the number one thing on the list is the absolute state of games media today. <sighs> Are angry, ranty gamers, like, still a thing? I know this is an old bit, and there's a new archetype in town now, but I figured it would be harder to do the whole sterile blather for six hours with no editing thing in a gag, so... Hello everyone, this is the Pedantic Player. For the next 300 minutes, come along with me on a journey through the Bible of Psychology, the DSMV, as we clinically diagnose every NPC in The Witcher. Now you might be asking yourself, TPP, is this massive monument to your own ego what passes for YouTube analysis these days? And I am here to tell you, yes. Yes, it is. No, 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 no! At least this parody has a purpose. It's time to name them and shame them. Well, Ragies, as usual, the corrupt, fake news games media is just totally out of touch. They're so far up there in their elite ivory towers that they can't even see reality staring them in the face. Now, you and I know what the real 2020 game of the year was. Not the critic's choice, but the people's choice. A breathtaking experience that pushed the medium to new heights and demonstrated what games are truly capable of. And all this, despite being slandered by biased journalists and media personalities. That's right, you simps. Animal Crossing New Horizons forever. Like many families around the world, Amy and Peggy Okuda are grappling with staying emotionally connected while physically apart. I have a present for you. You do? And although the mother-daughter duo hasn't been able to keep up with their routines in the real world, <laughs> they found a suitable and surprising alternative in Animal Crossing's virtual world. My name is Michael Saba, and I create videos examining the world through the pop culture that reflects and shapes our reality. A series I call Dreaming in Neon. This is a story about how the old world is dying, and the new world is struggling to be born. I know this is a super hot take, but 2020 was not a good year. It was not a good year for people, it was not a good year for the video game industry, and it was not a good year for the people who make video games. Which makes the few rays of hope that we got feel all the more precious and vital. And when I think of the things that gave me comfort and sustained me over the past year, Animal Crossing New Horizons is always on my mind. New Horizons came out in March of 2020, and it is in so many ways exactly what the core gaming audience says it wants in a big budget title. An open-ended, player-driven sandbox with a heavy emphasis on crafting and resource gathering, and a cornucopia of motivators, both extrinsic and intrinsic, to guide progress. And perhaps most crucially of all, there's no predatory monetization or DLC scheme trying to nickel and dime the player in pursuit of recurring revenue to satisfy the board of directors. In an age of COVID-induced isolation and general social collapse, Animal Crossing was the perfect game in the perfect moment. A tiny digital Zen garden that we may tend to and meditate upon a literal island of predictability and comfort in a sea of unknowns. It allows us to construct an idealized version of reality and express our very best selves. It is so damn creative, and it is so damn adorable. New Horizons is a joyous fulfillment of the potential of games as an artistic medium. 
At the time this video is being released, it sold nearly 30 million copies. And in 2020, Animal Crossing also became a legitimate, globe-devouring pop culture phenomenon. The first Animal Crossing game debuted on the N64 in Japan in 2001, and was ported to the GameCube later that year. The first entry in the series sold millions of copies, and was very highly praised for its innovative and non-linear structure. New Horizons builds on the formula established by this and subsequent titles. You arrive in a new town, take out a massive no-interest loan from Tom Nook, and proceed to build an entire community from scratch through resource gathering, crafting, and making nice with your new neighbors. For disaffected millennials and Zoomers, having your own place to live and a neighborhood full of friendly faces is about the most engaging power fantasy we could ask for. There's no punishment or failure states in Animal Crossing, no losing your progress because you didn't make it to the checkpoint. Rewards and encouragement, on the other hand, come fast and easy. Every action the player takes usually has some kind of motivator, whether that's more resources, new furnishings, or tools with which you can better shape and explore your environment. The absence of a failure state and the abundance of guidance for the player makes for an extremely pleasant, relaxing, and low-stakes play experience. Rather than putting the emphasis on theory crafting and min-maxing the dominant strat, the player is constantly guided towards a more creative and empathetic engagement with their environment. You are rewarded for simply doing things and experimenting with the world that surrounds you, regardless of how optimal your approach was. It's a design philosophy that stands in opposition to gaming's general obsessions with conquest, domination, and destruction. I think this is a huge part of the reason New Horizons became a cultural phenomenon in 2020. Both mechanically and aesthetically, it is a desperately needed reprieve from the crushing grind and misery of modern existence. In a moment when a deadly transnational plague had foreclosed on most forms of social interaction, New Horizons became a way to simulate the lives we were all missing out on. High schoolers who wouldn't get the chance to go to prom or attend a graduation ceremony in 2020 found the next best thing in New Horizons. Since live music isn't a thing anymore, musicians used it as a platform to interact with fans. Ladies and gentlemen, performing live, T-Pain. Yeah. As the Islamic holy sites Mecca and Medina stood eerily deserted all year, ex vlambeer honcho Rami Ismail organize daily prayers at sunrise and sunset. Alhamdulillah. And even AOC and Joe Biden campaigned via Animal Crossing, which proved so cringeworthy that Nintendo had no choice but to institute a blanket ban on in-game politicking. I, like so many others, celebrated many a holiday in Animal Crossing in 2020. We couldn't enjoy the usual festivities for our friends' birthdays or for holidays like Halloween and New Year's. So, New Horizons gave us alternatives, and with them, some small measure of joy. I've already forgotten how I spent my 33rd birthday, but I know that for the rest of my life, I'll never forget how I spent my 34th at Deli's house, and how this spark of delight in the otherwise bleak landscape of 2020 brought me to tears, right there on my living room couch. When it comes to all the meaningful ways that people experience, share, and enjoy video games, Animal Crossing was the biggest gaming event of the year, and will likely stand as one of the medium's defining cultural moments in this still young decade. Yet, as 2020 closed out, it was clear that New Horizons would not get nearly as much critical acclaim or analysis as some of its contemporaries. Not from the mainstream press, or from the enthusiast critical gaming outlets. Instead, the conversation around Animal Crossing took place in alternative forums, in Discord channels and on social media, on Pinterest boards and in viral memes, and via image galleries and YouTube exposés where user-created designs could proliferate and flourish. 
And when it came time to dole out the usual Game of the Year nods, almost every single outlet moved with great speed to show why this is such a banal and useless award in the first place. Barring the LA Times and a handful of other low traffic sites, New Horizons appears pretty far down the usual end of year lists. And that's if it appears at all, besides as the token best Switch game. It's not in the pages of the New York Times or on IGN. Not in Newsweek, nor on Eurogamer. All of this begs some burning questions. How did this happen? Why did the entire media miss, or outright ignore, the biggest gaming story of the year? New Horizons certainly doesn't look or play like previous GOTY winners, which is automatically disqualifying for a not insignificant portion of critics and the gaming audience. You don't have to be a true gamer honed on shooters and souls likes to pick up Animal Crossing, have an amazing time, and build magnificent creations. Like my own partner, for example. Normally, the most gaming Mina ever enjoyed was the occasional bout of Puzzle Fighter or Tekken, or an hour or two of Spyro here and there. But with the dawn of New Horizons, Boo Boo became a bona fide gamer who now spends at least an hour or two every single evening tending to our island paradise. It's hard not to think about when Stardew Valley was released back in 2016. Considering its influence and its still enduring popularity, this game could easily have been considered a GOTY contender for 2016, and for many of the same reasons that I've just outlined for Animal Crossing. But the conversation that year was all about Uncharted 4 and Overwatch, games that most folks seem to have already forgotten about. New Horizons earned a very respectable Metacritic score of 90, and generated a brief surge of interest in the gaming press around the time of its release. But after the initial hype died down, gaming publications moved on, and mostly ignored the cultural sensation that unfolded. And once search volume and SEO started to decline, mainstream publications followed suit and stopped writing trend pieces. Animal Crossing resists our binge-happy media consumption habits, which no doubt colored how it was received. Most big blockbuster releases these days are designed with the Netflix approach in mind. This is content to be feasted upon, inhaled in as few sittings as possible until the player has absolutely gorged themselves on dozens or even hundreds of hours of play. But almost all of Animal Crossing's systems and design flourishes run counter to this mode of experience. It is designed to be played for an hour or two at a time, and then set down to be picked up again the next day, or the day after, or whenever you feel like it. In other words, it's the perfect kind of game, drip-fed over the course of weeks and months, around which extended critical conversation can grow and thrive. And yet, this mostly didn't happen. I have surveyed the media landscape for long-form, in-depth write-ups of New Horizons, and I don't have much to show for it. Wired did a decent feature situating Animal Crossing within the larger rise of the walking simulator genre, and over on Polygon, they applied the old pop psychology mindfulness lens of analysis. And a special nod to The Atlantic, which ran this brain rot from professional academic troll Ian Bogost, who suggests that Animal Crossing's explosive popularity reveals how we, quote, find comfort in tedious, bureaucratic, pandering authoritarianism. Besides these examples I've cited, there really isn't much else to point to in terms of serious analysis and critique of New Horizons, or of the cultural phenomena it sparked. I don't think every outlet or critic should agree about Animal Crossing's greatness or importance. And I don't think that capturing the zeitgeist automatically makes a title GOTY, or that popular games are automatically good. My 2020 game of the year is not Animal Crossing. It's 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim a magnificently executed visual novel meets RTS, complete with Vanillaware's trademark lavish hand-drawn art. But I am also self-aware enough to realize that my tastes are very specific. It stands for Otaku Convention. And Otaku's a guy like me who likes Japanimation. Even if 13 Sentinels is the game that resonated the most with me on a personal level this year, I have no pretensions that everyone else should or even can feel the same way. 
This game meant so much to me because I've been immersed in the pop culture of 80s and 90s Japan for three decades. Someone with a different life story will have a totally different reaction to this game. Like... Why does this look like you're playing with Precious Moments dolls? You may have played Assassin's Creed games every year for the past decade, but Ghosts of Tsushima won't necessarily mean the same thing to someone who hasn't. Ditto, Hades and roguelikes, or Last of Us 2 and Sony's particular brand of third-person prestige up I've been playing and loving games my whole life, and yet I cannot ignore the reality that capital G gaming culture, despite its recent shallow gestures towards progressivism and inclusivity, has nevertheless been stuck on the same systems and loops and game design best practices for more than a decade now. For all of its elevated sense of self-regard, gaming is still struggling to progress as a critical and artistic medium. And this is not because of racism and retrograde masculinity run amok, nor is it because of the elitism that's also present in the mediums of print, radio, and broadcast. These broad and systemic failures are the result of material, market forces. The present social order worldwide, whether under Western neoliberalism or Eastern state socialism, calls for a brutal market logic in all areas of our life, including art. We are compelled to think of ourselves as atomized units of ceaseless production and consumption, always striving to maximize our potential, never stopping, always grinding. I'm not in favor of fairness. I'm in favor of freedom. And freedom is not fairness. Fairness means somebody has to decide what's fair. Uh, but freedom means uh, subordination to the decisions of concentrated, unaccountable, private power. That's what it means. The institutions of governance or other kinds of association that could allow people to participate in decision-making, those are systematically weakened. This globe-spanning mechanization of the human experience logically extends to art. Artistic expression becomes a consumer product to be sold at scale, and so it must be safe, familiar, and easy to reproduce. And that's what we get. More of the same. To take one of the most high-profile examples in 2020, the Last of Us 2's rushed and mismanaged production process may have satisfied the demands of capital, but it came at a tremendous human and artistic cost. During the game's development, hundreds of Naughty Dog employees were treated as though they were, effectively, disposable machinery. Designers, artists, and developers alike were reportedly subjected to a grueling, crunch death march, up to and including 12-hour workdays for months at a time. In a move that no doubt greatly pleased the shareholders, this enormous game was put out after just about two and a half years of full-time development. And this came right after Uncharted 4, which itself had a similarly troubled dev cycle, notorious for employee burnout and turnover. I failed at that on this project. Um, tried certain things that didn't work, and we're gonna try different things going forward, and we're bringing outside help to help us with that. That's a whole different conversation. Was the creation of a bigger, badder, bolder, 30-hour-long version of the first Last of Us worth the human cost? Did the end result justify the exploitation and misery that it took to get there? And the Game Award goes to... And the Game Award goes to... And our winner is... And the Game Award goes to... The Last of Us Part 2. Congratulations! The Last of Us 2 received an armload of Game of the Year nods and awards, with the extensively documented labor abuses not receiving much more than minor, hand-wringing asides in most write-ups, if they were mentioned at all. The Last of Us 2 is the Game of the Year, in the same way that Cyberpunk 2077 was the Game of the Year. It's an experience that embodies all of gaming's contradictions, its unbridled creativity and its sheer banality, its euphoric highs and its soul-crushing lows. It's proof that Margaret Thatcher's dictum has sadly won out. There is no alternative. We cannot conceive of a world outside of the regime of marketized capital and finance. The very horizons of our consciousness have become constrained within this material reality. Look, let me be just real plain and simple for a second. Gamers 
should hate market capitalism more than anyone. But Animal Crossing expresses a universalist and humanist message that is essential to this moment. Your life should not be full of hopeless drudgery and despair, nor should you be fixated with greed, accumulation, and domination. A life well lived is about taking things slow, savoring the moment, and sharing good times with the people you care about. Little moments of joy and delight, like those we got to enjoy in Animal Crossing, help us connect to each other. They're part of how we've kept hope alive during a hideously grim period of human history. With the hope that the seasonal and life milestone rituals we perform in the game will someday be restored to the real world. In what amounts to a remarkable and almost certainly unintentional social experiment, Animal Crossing has turned millions and millions of us around the world into 21st century digital shamans and mystics. Whether we know it consciously or not, it's given us all a new appreciation for the power of collective ritual. I've taken cracks at YouTube culture in both this and other videos, but I gotta say, what this episode has really impressed upon me is the fact that even as the marketization of existence is dismantling journalism as a profession, independent content creators and bloggers are still doggedly doing the work that just isn't being done by bigger outlets. Which is also part of what makes New Horizons itself so special. As the world we know collapses around us, Animal Crossing does not ask us to revel in the destruction. It asks us to imagine, to dream, that we can still build a better future. Thank you for watching. I'm going all in on YouTube for 2021. This essay was the first of a half dozen scripts I've got on deck for the next few videos I'm making. There's more great stuff on the way, including my next long-form deep dive. So if you enjoy the content I make and want to support an independent creator, please consider donating a buck or two on Patreon. I really want to go full steam with content this year, and anything you can pledge will go a long way towards making this dream a reality. But hey, I know things are bad right now. 2020 wasn't a great year for me, and 2021 isn't looking much better. So. If you can't donate, that's okay. I suck at self-promotion, so just sharing my content with the people you care about is tremendously helpful. See you next time.